The year is now 2014. It has been nine years since Mavuno Church was planted. And after oscillating between different venues, it's now time for the Mavuno movement of churches to finally settle into its own headquarters. A 20-acre piece of land has been identified on the outskirts of Nairobi, one of East Africa's largest cities. And after months of fundraising, enough resources have become available to not only allow for a deposit to be placed on the land, but for the movement headquarters to start the process of relocating. But what was the relocation experience like? And was there enough resource available to the Mavuno movement to pull this off? Once again, we go back to the senior pastor, Muredi Wanjao, to hear his take on the relocation process. So, moving to Hill City, it was an exciting adventure. I mean, it, it involved the whole congregation. It was, it was very exciting to be in that process. Uh, it was also a huge challenge uh, because we had to raise uh, $3.5 million. And part of the reason is because two, uh, two million of that was to purchase the land and then 1.5 was to help develop it so it was habitable, which was this big piece of land. And the crazy thing is that people in Mavuno actually, by faith, uh, pledged even more than that. I think it was 3.57 million that actually eventually uh, was pledged. And faithfully, every weekend, every month, people brought in their resources. I mean, people took such huge sacrifices. It was astounding even to me. And it was clear that God was very, very much behind this. Uh, and because of the urgency of the move, as we were looking at moving and we felt there was so much pressure from the landlord on the back end, uh, there was also just a desire that we would finally move into our own property. Eventually, we felt we needed to take a mortgage facility uh, for the balance that we had not yet raised. And we said that we need to take this one because we, don't, we didn't want to get to a place where we are caught flat-footed on this other side. And so we, we took a facility of $1.5 million um, uh, dollars and with the whole intention that our pledges would help us to cover that. And we moved uh, to Hill City. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, it was, it was a great, I remember the first service there. It was just, look what the Lord has done. It was a powerful, powerful time. But here's what began to happen. One of the things we hadn't counted on was just the spiritual opposition in that area. Um, you know, that area is, had been known to just be a tough spiritual, uh, spiritual area. And we didn't even know this as we moved in. And we found there was so much opposition. I remember people would come to church and they would just have a headache. I mean, you just feel sick and it was inexplicable. Would have dust storms that would roll across the church in the middle of a service. Uh, I remember people would just feel uh, just unwell and go home just feeling like they were just not lifted up. They just felt unwell. And there was a, an, an attack, not just on our leadership, our staff members, but our congregation as well. And in the process, I, many, many people stopped coming to church. And as the leaders, we weren't equipped at that point to even help them deal with what we were experiencing. And so you can imagine you're at the place where you've got this, uh, at the place where you want to pay off this loan very quickly. That was the plan. But then we weren't able to because even our numbers had gone down. Resultantly, even our financial might at that point had gone down. And so we resulted in just paying off our mortgage regularly, every month, as we've been doing faithfully since at the time. Uh, but you know, here's the thing I want to say, as difficult as that settling was, I'm really excited about it when I think back because it was a time we began to understand spiritual warfare and it really grew our spiritual muscles in ways that I believe are going to be extremely helpful as we as God's people step out across the world to take territory for our King Jesus. Three years before Mavuno moved its headquarters to the Hill City area in Kenya, Mavuno gave birth to its first European campus, Mavuno Church Berlin. Pastor Daniel Fleshig planted the campus in 2011 and was present when Mavuno began to speak about owning a headquarters. He has since been back to visit the headquarters many times, and we wanted to hear the unique perspective that a European church planter from Mavuno would bring to this conversation. I had the unique opportunity to serve at Mavuno when its headquarters was still at Bellevue. However, in 2011, we left the community there and headed for Berlin, where together with my wife Nancy, we have been the pastors of Mavuno Berlin ever since. While we have been pretty occupied in Europe with overseeing the church, I have been extremely impressed to see how the headquarters has taken shape. I remember this time I came to Hill City, it was um, in January 15, my first visit. Today, when I visit the place, it is extremely different from a lonely place far away from other developed structures. Now it is in the midst of a city that has grown there with roads, apartments, shops. It's beautiful. 
the landscaping that has been done, the trees, the plants. It is not that dry and harsh place anymore. It's, it's much greener, it's just beautiful. And I'm excited at the prospect of us completing the depth at Hill City because I see the opportunity for impact across nations and even continents. When I look at Europe today, I am saddened by the state of Christianity. Europe was once the center of Christian mission and had incredibly strong Christian heritage. Today, when you look across Europe, what I see is the need for more churches, for stronger, for healthier churches, for an increased Christian testimony, for awakening. As long as Mabuno still has debt on its headquarters, we will always be held back from impacting Europe and bringing the change that this continent needs. I see Hill City as a place from where many world changes will be sent out and begin to impact many European nations. With that said, I want to encourage you. If you have not considered making a pledge towards our Free the Future initiative, this is the time to do it. appreciate our media team for always bringing us these stories. I really appreciate that. Karibuni sana. For those who don't know me, my name is Kevin Kilonzi. I'm one of the pastors in this church. Uh, my wife and I have the awesome privilege of being the lead pastors of Mabuno Church downtown campus. Yes! We're loving it! Um, uh, if you're new, by the way, uh, we are in the middle of uh, a campaign where we're giving our, our first fruits, the first uh, or an equivalent of your monthly salary towards free in the future of this movement, towards giving uh, so that we can free, free uh, the mortgage that, as we've had uh, been talked about uh, in the video. Uh, I, I, as I watched Pastor Daniel, I, I don't know, th there's something that connected with me, especially in that first picture where the, you have this amazing cathedral, but then the seats and the pews are just dusty. Have you seen that? I, 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 but I don't know for why, but it really crushed me. I was like, man. The gospel somehow has to go back. But we cannot, we cannot be held back by things that, you know, like we cannot, we cannot do that if we are being held back by, you know, by resources and all those things. And so I feel it's time for us to just free our future and to allow people, to allow that go, the people that God is calling to go to the ends of the earth. I'm really excited about that. As I watched our kids uh, lead us in worship and dance, was that cute and amazing? I know there is all, you know, you, you are used to your seat being somewhere, you are used to your sound coming to you in a certain way, but it was just beautiful to watch that. The person who was being washed with God, really, I believe, was like, is, this is beautiful. I've ordained praise in the mouths of infants, and they are worshipping me, and we are giving them the opportunity to be able to do that. I love that. Um, and so, uh, I want to encourage you, uh, sorry for the sound, uh, something that, that will be sorted in a minute, uh, but I want to encourage you, if you are there, you have, you have probably considered giving towards the few in the future, uh, maybe you've done it and, and you've been, you know, lagging behind in redeeming the pledge, I want to encourage you to go for it, I want to encourage you to take the plunge and just see what God will be able to do uh, as you step in there. As I say, guys, I am happy to be your lead pastor. Let me, t no, it's true, by the way. Let me tell you, I think this is one of the most generous churches, not just in Mavuno Church as a movement, but actually in Nairobi. I actually believe we are, downtown specifically, is one of the most generous churches around. Last Sunday, I shared with you our giving, our pledges. They were at what, who, who remembers how much downtown had pledged towards uh, Free the Future? 9.9 .9 million. Do you know how much was there by, I think, yesterday evening, because that's the last time I checked, just in case someone has pledged there, and they're like, oh, it's more. <laughs> By yesterday evening, we had moved from 9.9 .9 million to 13.48 million. Oh, come on, people. Come on. This is, oh, this is the movement one. I'm talking about specifically for downtown. Because I want you to know that I'm happy, I'm excited, I'm encouraged that you guys are part of what we are doing. Uh, downtown's pledges are at about 22% of what the entire movement has given. And I really believe that we are not giving because, you know, uh, we are more blessed than others. I don't think it's... I don't think it's that. I actually believe it's because people have gotten to that place of saying, I'm going to be generous with God, and then let me see what God will do with my finances. I'm happy that it's not just 
you guys, you know, it's not just the congregation. It's a pastoral team leading that process. It's a discipleship group leaders leading that process. It's the people who serve in this church leading in that process. And I want to invite anyone else to just be on board in this thing. I, I don't know. Me, I'm like, God, if, if a church is given, I know God will do these things for us. But I really pray that downtown will also get to a place where we are now uh, in the process of owning our three floors in the city. Come on, people. I really believe we do it. I have been praying for three floors in this city without pillars. Remember to add that in your prayers. Without, not just take kubiri, and then I say, and then, amen, like, I, without pillars. I really believe God will give it to us. And, and, and so I'm excited to give towards uh, uh, freeing the future of the movement headquarters, because it's not really a hill city facility. It's a movement headquarters. Berlin depends on that facility is there. Can you imagine if, Pastor B, you know, he came, Pastor uh, Daniel came with friends, and then we were living in tents, and then we are not there because, you know, you've been kicked out. And then now he has, come on. At least they have a home. Even them, they know they have a home in Nairobi. And so my prayer is that downtown one day will get to start our own our capital campaign. But guess what? The entire movement will say downtown has given towards all our campuses. I want us to be able to give towards that as well. And we, we just don't get to share as much with you guys about these churches or these campuses generosity with other churches but there are times we've had to pay rent for other churches there are times we've sorted out uh, salaries for other pastors there are times we've sorted out uh, different operational things for other churches and and of course you can be like when you are paying, it's it's okay but there are times god allows us to be able to do that to test our own church's generosity and so i want us to be one of the most generous churches not just in mavuno church movement but in the city as well. Because I believe if we are generous in Mavuno, probably we are the mo most generous in the city uh, as well. And so I want to encourage you to give. Uh, the giving number will, all, will be on the screen so you can give uh, uh, towards, uh, you know, a pay bill. If you're giving tithes and offerings, uh, these are the details there. Uh, if you're giving towards Free the Future, there is an app, one of the most easiest to use app, uh, uh, www.freethefuture.org. So you can use that uh, app. Uh, to give towards uh, free the future it's easy to use um I, I, you know as much as possible just use that plus, plus it also allows us to track our giving towards free the future because you don't want to mix what you're giving towards free the future with what you're giving uh, for church operations you know tithes and offering uh, as well and so let me pray let me make a prayer even as we uh, as we give our tithes and offerings um i just have the the the, the tithes and offering uh, slide up uh, just in case someone wants to use that. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your love and kindness. Thank you for your favor and mercy. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for everyone who calls downtown their home church. I want to pray a blessing over them. I want to pray for uh, uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, a financial overflow over everyone who gives faithfully, who tithes sacrificially, uh, who gives uh, from the overflow. Uh, of their resources, oh God, to ensure that this ministry is established. We are praising you because we can see kids uh, who are now rising up to be the next generation of fearless influencers. We are giving towards transformation. We are giving towards life change. We are giving towards churches being planted. We are giving towards uh, nations uh, being restored back to you. We honor you and we glorify you. In the mighty and matchless name of our Lord Christ and Savior, I do pray and believe. And all of us said, Amen and amen, amen and amen. If you're a visitor uh, here today, let me welcome you to church. Can we just celebrate our visitors one more time? I hear on Friday there was a worship night and a half. Hey, I apologize. I had to go on a short-term mission to Yata, uh, but I hear it was epic. Guys, come for worship night. When you hear the families gathering, Atakama ni nyamachoma, you come. Because the Lord will move in mighty ways there. I hear someone who came to church sick, but in the presence of worship, they went home uh, healed. Uh, some discipleship groups came to church, and after church, they went for pizza, hanged out, and then went back home. I mean, when the last time you're in the city eating pizza at night? Only if you come for worship night. So, okay, you know, legally, like just come on up and have to bring in siku for city. Come for worship night and, and be blessed. Um, we started a new sermon series two weeks ago uh, that we are calling. Come on, guys. Mavuno kids are remembering their memory verses. At least remember the series. <laughs> for God and for country and through it, we are hoping to challenge everyone and to rally everyone to see this country as a gift from God. 
My prayer is that all of us will be able to engage uh, in our God-given duty to pray, to build, and to participate in this nation's politics. I think as a generation, we have really downplayed the effect or the, the, the role of politics in the nation. We have really downplayed uh, our role in participating in the nation's politics. Uh, we've, played, we've downplayed the, the, the importance of being able to do that. I want to say this, that politics are at the core of our lives. Politics are the center of lives. Politics affects how our economics run. Um, Mavuno Downtown runs, uh, or we have a ministry house uh, not far from here, a space where we do ministry from. It's where our offices are. Uh, if you are new here or if you are in a team, ask your team leader to take you there. Uh, so we operate from there. So Tuesdays we have our staff meetings, and we usually get mandazis from Klabu just so that we can grow the local economy. And so uh, we sent, you know, this, this past week we sent someone, you know, to get us mandazi. We actually called the lady because she, you know, dropped the mandazi uh, at, in our office. We called her, hey, can you bring mandazi? And she said, I've stopped making mandazi because the, the, the cost of oil, the cost of cooking oil is too high. It doesn't make financial sense to make mandazi. Can you imagine? That's where it is. That's where we are uh, as a nation. Now, of course, I know there are geopolitical things. Oh, this is in Ukraine, Mafte, Mepanda. But even a bachelor asked, Sasa mkipandisha, you know, eggs to be 14 bob. Kwa nizi natumia mafuta kutaga. Like, <laughs> like everything is been affected. But I think at the center of that, there is a political thing. There is, there, 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 politics affect all that. Politics affect, or governance affects how our country runs the reserves and how they are used and all that. And so there is need for all of us to be able to engage in the way that our nation will go. You see, as a nation, every five years, we undergo an experience that is akin to like, a, it's like a political heart surgery. Tensions are always high. Political rhetoric of the most dangerous kind dominate the hearts and minds of every Kenyan. And so that's why we are talking about politics uh, in church uh, through this month. We are talking about our space in, you know, redeeming that uh, for the honor and glory of God. Uh, we are taking this series from the book of Esther. Now, of, of course, as I've said, Esther was written in the 4th century BC. What had happened is that uh, the Jews had been taken to exile in Babylon, and then the Babylonians had been overthrown by the Medes and the Persians, and then the Medes and the Persians had started to allow the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild uh, their city. And so guys are starting to go, to go back to Jerusalem. The book of Ezra talks about those who went back to rebuild the temple. The book of Nehemiah talks about those who went back to rebuild the walls. But the book of Esther is uh, um, a curious one because it doesn't talk about those who went back. It talks about those who remained in that Babylon economic system. Because it's, it's not just Babylon a place. Babylon is, is, is an economic system. It's a political system. It's a, it's a technological system. It's, it's the entire system. And they remain there. And we get to see God's hand in leading them on to navigate the nuances of being uh, in that place. Now, as I've, as I've shared, my hope through this series is to get all of us to a point where we are touched enough to care about this nation, to get involved in its politics, to get up, to pray for the nations, but also to do something practical to see it transformed. Today, we'll sort of double back with the, with the, with the passage that we read last week, uh, Esther chapter 3, but I'm going to take in, a I'm going to be focusing on just two verses that I believe are, are, are crucial uh, and I believe that the entire book of Esther hinges on those two uh, uh, pointers that we're going to be uh, reading from. So Esther chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. This is what he says. After these events, uh, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Amaditha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than all the other nobles. Verse 2. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman. So the, 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 the story is now being set in that way. For the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. That's a crucial part uh, in the story today. Verse 3 says this. Then the royal officials of the king's gate, uh, at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Mordecai had noticed he was sort of like a gate man or sort of like a, a people, like watchman or something. People who uh, guarded the, 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 uh, the gates at the king's, uh, at the king's court. So that's where he's, this is his workplace. Yeah, but he has decided not to do something uh, in his workspace in that sense. Why do you disobey the king's command? Verse 4. Day after day they spoke to him. Can you imagine? Day after day. Day after day. Now, the Bible is not short of words. He could have said every day. But day after day is to give us 
an insight into what is happening. The, 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 give me the word. Come on, guys. What's that word? The emphasis. Thank you. The emphasis of, of, of things happening, like it's emphasizing day after day. It could have said every day. It could have said as often, but a day after day, there's an emphasis there in like people nagging you day after day, uh, uh, telling you that. Anyway, day after day, they spoke to him, uh, but he refused to comply. Therefore, uh, uh, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. This is the other part that we'll be focusing on today. For he had told them that he was a Jew. He had told them that he was a Jew. So Mordecai is, uh, is a sort of a gatekeeper in this uh, um, palace. The palace is in a place called Susa. So it was a citadel of Susa. This is where the king, I think, would go for, I think it's a winter palace. Like there are different palaces. So this is like the winter palace. When it's winter, this is where he would rule from. From, uh, and, and he had a cousin, he was the older cousin of Esther. Uh, Esther was um, an orphan at this point, and so he sort of adopts her, and she grows up uh, in her house. At some point, there's a mess, uh, you know, the queen uh, needs to be dethroned, and, and there's a vir- you know, there, there's an edict going out that all the young virgins, beautiful young virgins of the land, were to be gathered, and so that the king would choose one of them uh, to be uh, her queen in place of Vashti. As fate would have it, Esther ends up being the lady chosen to be uh, the queen, to become the queen instead of Vashti. That's what the Bible is saying in verse 3, verse 1, when it says all this after these events, those are the events. The dethroning of a king, a queen rather, the choosing of a queen, uh, those are the things that are happening in Esther chapter uh, 1 and 2. And now we are told that Haman, after all these things, Haman is now elevated, given a place of honor, given a place of, uh, pros- you know, uh, uh, you know, people looking up to him in that way. And one of the things that happens in that place of honor is that people are supposed to kneel down, pay him honor as he passes by. And then verse 2 introduces the tension and says, but Mordecai will not kneel down and pay him honor. And then towards the end of verse 4, the fellow guards at the gates keep coming into him day after day. They are telling him to do this. But then the Bible tells us uh, that, for, uh, that he could not do it for he had told them that he was a Jew. Mordecai refused to do everything that people were telling him because he was a Jew. And so Haman sees that. He, he recognizes that uh, Mordecai is a Jew. He's told that he's a Jew. And so he's like, I'm not even going to kill you alone, Mordecai. I'm going to do in your entire community. And so now a verdict, another verdict has gone out. All the Jews are to be killed on a certain day uh, in, in, in a month. It was actually a year from them. A year from then. All the Jews were going to be killed uh, uh, just because one man had decided to stand up. One man had decided not to do the unlawful. Why? For he had told them that he was a Jew. Naaman refused to uh, uh, bow down. Not because he was rebelling. Not because, like, you know, like outright rebellion, like, yo, me, I'm a rebel. No. Not because he was, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, had a grudge against Haman. He did not refuse to, you know, to bow down because he had issues with the king. No. The, is- the reason why he refused to bow down was something within him. It was not something outside of him. It was not because of Haman and who he is. It was not because of something that was within him. Because I'm a Jew. He did not say what the king has said is wrong. He did not say there was something in him that made him say, I will not bow down because I'm a Jew. Today, someone is titled this, because I am a Christian. Come on. Could you tell it to yourself? Can you say, can you say, because I am a Christian? Could you la- look at someone seated next to you and tell them, because I am a Christian? Now, I personally think that we as Christians highly discount our God-given role on why we have been called to be Christians in the first place. I think we have really downplayed the, the significance of you being called a Christian in our world today. I think, I think we know why we are born again. Uh, we know there is heaven coming after this. This is not the end, people. There is still heaven. But I think many times we know what is coming, but we are living in the present reality with these issues and all that. And so we have downplayed what it means to be a Christian. And there, yes, we, we, we want to have everything, but we know there's sort of like some fire insurance at the end of the day. So we are waiting for that. But in the meantime, we haven't known how to utilize our Christianity or our belief to the full extent of why we've been called to be here. And so many sometimes you could be waiting in a twinkle on number nine, whoop, we are taken up to heaven, hasta la vista, earth, see you later, maybe never, like you're gone. 
But in the meantime, we are under living, we are under living the full, like, what it means to actually be Christians now. We are aware of it. We know we confess Jesus. Yes, we show up on Sunday. But the full extent of what it means for us to be believers in the here and now, I think many times we are underliving it. Because I am a Christian. Sometimes we don't pause long enough to actually unpack that question and ask ourselves, why did I remain on earth after I gave my life to Christ? Is that the end goal? And it's part of the game, let me tell you, yes. You need to you give your life to Christ. There is life after this. But if that's it, what, what are you, what, have you unpacked what it means for you to be a believer in the here and now? Many times you end up being like soldiers who have enrolled in the army, but we are still caught up in civilian affairs. A war is raging, uh, uh, the creation is groaning, all these things are dying, you know, people are dying, but you are caught up in the here and now. We are caught up in some issues in the here and now. And we, uh, in the end, we end up under living we end up, we end up, you know, fighting some small battles here and there, but you are not, you are not focusing on the real war that you've been called to wage in the here and now. It started in the Garden of Eden. God, God has made creation for five days. On the sixth day, is like, yo, I'm gonna do something amazing. Uh, uh, Genesis one twenty six says us, uh, God speaking uh, to the, uh, God speaking uh, in uh, uh, Genesis one twenty six says. The, then God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And he gives the reason why he does that. So that they may, come on people, so that they, so that they may rule. And he says, over fish, over sea, over birds of the sky, over livestock, over all white animals, over all creation that move along the ground. And so God was dead serious about creating a, a, you know, a human person who may rule over what he had made. And God is serious about that because after he made them, uh, the first thing he does, Genesis 1, 28, is to do this. The Bible says, and God blessed them. It's a blessing. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and then the other yellow part is rule, rule, rule. We are created for a purpose. We are created for work. We are created for a reason. Uh, and, 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 you know, God says, I want you to subdue. I want you to rule. In fact, the NKJV puts it even better. It says, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Dominion, to dominate, to be over. That's what God wanted to, us to do. But that capacity to rule, to have dominion, to, 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 uh, uh, to subdue, was not supposed to be down outside of a relationship with God. Because we were not the owners, it's like God was doing, we were, we were managing, we were stewarding, but God was really the owner. And so our job of ruling and subduing and, and having dominion was supposed to be done in a close relationship with God. But you know what happens right after this? Man sin, man, you know, commits sin. We go against God's word. The relationship we had with God was broken and, 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 uh, and, and not just spiritually for us, but the entire creation was subjected to groaning and mourning. The thing that was supposed to rule because of our own disobedience, sin enters and everything is dashed like that. Sin enters. Man is alienated from God and the entire creation is now subjected to chaos. I want you to know that the fall of man did not just affect us at a spiritual level. The fall of man affected everything. Economics, technology, politics that was supposed to be done in a certain way. And even how we uh, utilize the resources of the earth that were supposed to rule and dominate, all that is chaos. Uh, Romans 8, uh, 19 and 21 says this, uh, 19 and 21 rather says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Guys, there's something that we are supposed to do. There's work that is supposed to be done. Human interactions, which is politics, were supposed to be done in a certain way. But the fall of man, uh, uh, us being alienated from God, destroys all that. It comes in the way of all that. And so what was God supposed to do in bringing an intervention? What was God supposed to do 
for the salvation of man so that everything can go back into, into the correct order? How does creation get restored into the correct order? How do our interactions, politics, how do our economics get restored back to the correct order? Track with me, guys. I hope I've not lost you in anywhere, in, in any place. I'm answering the question, why is your Christianity important? Why is your Christianity important? Why is it important for you to know why you are a Christian? You see, God, uh, if, if you, if, so, so the world has fallen, things are, you know, everywhere, things are falling apart. If you are advising God, <laughs> you probably say, God, start with a perfect world, and God like, but I started with a perfect world. Do you know <laughs> that God started with a perfect world? No greed, no lust, no all those things. God started with a perfect world. But the problem of man was not the perfect world. The problem of man was sin that, is, that lays within, that every choice we want to make is against God. God gives us a free will, but we always choose it, use it to choose things that are opposed to God uh, in that way. Adam and Eve were the best that humanity could offer. Eden was the, blessed that hum the best that humanity could live in, but they all failed. You know, sometimes I hear people saying, man, if I was, if I was Adam, I would not have done that. You would have failed. First of all, he did have baggage issues, you know, like family baggage. Yeah, Adam didn't have, didn't have, uh, as, you know, like those generational curses. He was not dealing with that. My mother used to, no, 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 no. He didn't have that. You, you have that. He had never been broken hearted. His kids were not running around and so he forgot. No, you would have failed. Sometimes men say things I don't mean. You know, if, if you know, a lady asks a man, where would you men be if it was not for us women? And the man says, Garden of Eden for starters. I'm like, no. Bruh, you'd have, fo you'd have failed miserably. Would not have failed. Why? Man is not a sinner because he commits sin. Man commits sin because, first and foremost, he's born a sinner. The issue is within. The issue is within. And so it's not a, a perfect world would not have sorted it. In fact, God says, but I created a perfect world in that sense. And so you're over there. Man has sinned, man has failed, man has crushed, you know, the relationship he had with God. God created him for a purpose. How is God going to restore this broken man to the correct order? That's what I'm trying to answer. How does God do that? And so if you're advising God, you tell them, okay, God, start over. And God says, but I did that with Noah. Come on. God started over. You're like, okay, God, God. Start a different family. But I did that with Abraham. I took a new family and I said, I'm going to do this with them. But what did Adam, uh, Abraham do? He fails. He, you know, he's, he's somewhere. The, the, he's fearing for his life. You know, and, and you know, he has to say his sister, you, his wife is his sister. Uh, all that. At some point, the wife is like, oh, we are not getting the child that God promised. Sleep with our, you know, our handmaid. And he's like, no, I can't do that. Okay, so I'll take one for the team. I mean, it's all messed up. And his children get to do those th uh, things as well, at least some of the things that he did. And so maybe you're there, you're like, okay, God, do this, eh? Just give us a bunch of rules, maybe ten of them. And God's like, ten commandments, guys! I gave you the ten commandments, but none of us could keep them. And so man is broken. Man has, you know, uh, broken the relationship that he had with God. God created him for a purpose. The earth is still groaning and mourning because one give, God gives you the authority. He's not going to come and take it back. So how is he going to redeem that situation? A perfect world didn't do it for us. Starting over didn't do it for us. This is the condition of man. Starting a new family didn't do it for us. A bunch of rules didn't do it for us. Maybe you're like, okay, God, just give us a system of governance to enforce the rules. God is like, but I've raised kings and judges over you. Okay, God, make it spiritual, but I've raised prophets and apostles for you. The condition of man could not be sorted in any other way. <laughs> Maybe you're talking to God and you're like, okay, God, there's something we do in our generation now. Just take time out, count to ten. <laughs> time out. <laughs> and God says, 400 years of silence. Like, time out. So, uh, people, maybe you can sort yourself. Time out. 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Nothing could have sorted the condition of man because it's a brokenness of the heart. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 gives us hope. This is what the Bible says. But just at the right time, 
when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you see that? Just at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mavuno downtown, there was simply no other way to repair the broken relationship we had with God apart from the cross of Jesus. And that's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is there crying. Uh, uh, his, his, his capillaries are torn and blood is flowing. And he's saying, is there any other way to restore this man back to you? Is there any other way that Kevin Kilonzi would be saved? Is there any other way that the women of downtown would be saved? Lord, if there is, if there is any other way... Take this cup away from me. And God says, there is no other way. These people will not be saved by starting over. These people will not be saved by a bunch of rules. These people will not be saved by a system of governance. These people will not be saved by all that and more. And so Jesus takes the cross for you and I so that we can become believers. And then we play with it. Come on. Am I making sense? There was no other way to restore men back to God. And so Jesus takes the cross, takes the, sheds his own blood, so that you and I, who now become his followers, can help doing what we were created to do all along. People, tell your neighbor, because I'm a Christian. It matters. It matters and it counts for something. Man's fallen condition could not be redeemed in any other way apart from the blood of Jesus. And so Jesus now takes the authority back from the enemy. God, Jesus takes the authority back from the enemy. He had authority over everything. And the life of Jesus is to show us that he has authority. He has authority over nature. He was able to walk on water, look at storms and say, be still. He takes that authority over nature. He takes authority uh, uh, over, over diseases and our health. Just going around healing people so that you can see he has authority over health now. Takes that authority back from the enemy. He takes authority uh, over life. He's able to tell uh, uh, at least three accounts where we see Jesus raising people from the dead. He takes that authority. He has authority over spiritual realities, walking somewhere, demons fleeing and all that. He takes back that authority. And then what does Jesus do with the authority? He gives it back to his followers. Come on. He gives it back to us so that we can rule and reign, have dominion. Go everywhere to restore. I want to tell you guys, if you're waiting for the salvation of politics to come from any other place apart from us engaging, we will, we will come, we'll get it wrong. The, the, God, Jesus is not just saving the souls of men. Jesus is saving the systems that the men are in in the first place. To seek and save that which was lost, that's what Luke says. That which was lost. Because we just didn't lose spiritual connection with God. We lost, we lost the system as well. And so we need to be able to engage in that world. Because I'm a Christian. Back in the story, Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman because he was a Jew. He says, I'm a Jew, man. There's something in me that cannot bow down to that. I have to engage I have to restore things back to the correct order. Even if I'm the only Jew, because you don't have an account of other Jews not bowing down, even if I'm the last line of defense, I cannot do that. Even if it means, you know, I'm killed or every other person. You know, if you're advising Mordecai, I would say, bruh, you're already shot, just do it once, and then, you know, like, appease him. Because Mordecai means, you know, a little boy. So it's very possible that he was a short guy. Because I say, bruh, like, just, nene kea, ukuwapo red, but to show. You could have done that. But he said, no, I cannot do that. There's something in me that cannot bow down to the hammer of this world. Matthew 5, 13 and 16 says this. You are the salt of the earth. Guys, it's not just a song that Mavuno kids sang. It's, it's a reality we are supposed to live. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except for to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot. You are the salt of the earth. It's a lifestyle we must live. This nation must sense our saltiness. We are Christians. The nation must sense our saltiness in economics, in politics, in technology, in science. Don't make the mistake of 
you know, uh, uh, thinking that Jesus is just there for the souls, but not there for how the souls live after they have been saved. How we engage matters. We must go back and dominate politics, dominate economics, dominate every sector of society. Let me tell you that the God of church is also the God of science, is also the God of economics, is also the God of politics, and he wants it restored back to the correct order. Stop, you know, uh, 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 stop uh, putting God in a corner for Sunday only. No. God is interested in Monday through Saturday. Mordecai realized that bowing down to Haman on, on the, on, at the office, ooh, Mordecai realized that bowing down to Haman on Monday through Saturday did not, was, if, if that's what he was going to do, then his bowing down to God on Sunday then didn't matter. And he chose to say, I'm going to not bow to Haman on, on, a, on the weekday, but I'm also going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, do, do, to bow on the weekday and, and then, you know, you know, pretend to be standing on Sunday. No. He chose to have a consistent life. I don't bow down to that thing on Sunday or on Monday through Saturday at the workspace. For such a time as this, you are the salt. Are the people around your table making a distinction of their food or tasting their food because you exist there? Is there a difference in the spaces you are in? Because you are the salt. There is no other salt coming back to us. Mordecai decided that even if I'm the only one, man, I'm going to stand strong. I'm going to be here. But the verse says, but if salt loses its saltiness. You know, every now and then I, I, I cook at our home. Yeah, and um, I think over time my wife has been trying to convince me that I don't need to put the same amount of salt for the amount of food. You know, like, <laughs> Kevin, it's just a small, <laughs> thing. like I always over salt our food. So it's like, Kevin, just like, nyama, one, one kg of meat does not need one kg of salt. Do you know that? It actually just needs a pinch and it's good. <laughs> I know you think you're small, but you're enough for your workspace. Oh, come on, somebody. I know you think you're, you, you're insignificant and you have some issues, yes, but you're enough for the place that God wants you to seize on. Now, when I oversalt our food, what do I do? I, you know, marshal up my wife tendencies and I water the food. There's only one way that salt loses its saltiness and it's to water it down. Come on. Come on. Are you salty enough or have you watered some things down to accommodate a certain lifestyle? Am I preaching? Salt loses its wat saltiness when it's watered it down. Ask me. I was born in Moranga, by the way, like for real, for real. <laughs> I have a healthy relationship with water as a camber. But then there's something that calls me. Imagine that Joshua calls you. There's something in me. What, have you stood and watched from afar as things have been watered down? Uh, you know, have, have you stood and watered the fact that you need to stand up for corruption and bribing in your workspace because you are too, you know, you watered it down. You lost your saltiness in that way. Are you engaging? Are you the last line of defense saying, because I'm a Christian? The kingdom of God suffers violence. There is no equilibrium, but the violent, the salty, Take it by force. It will not be given to you, my friends. You have to take it. We have to engage in that way. As a, as a Christian businessman, is there a difference with your business with other, every other business there? Now we need to apply some natural laws of business and economics. Yes, market and you know, demand and all that. But we are not just in the natural laws. We are at a spiritual level. If you're sleeping, sometimes God can give you the download. But how can he give you the download if you're still operating the same way as the world does? God can give you an, a, 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 a business edge, a niche, something for you. But if you're still compromising as the world does, he's like, but you've lost your saltiness. I can do nothing with that. We have, we have, we have to choose to do, to be different uh, in that way. In business, in economics, in science. The God, of si the God of nature is the God of science, the God of politics uh, as well. Let's stand up like Mordecai. 
Let's do something because we are Christians. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Let me call uh, the band to come back. Mavuno kids, we love you. You guys have done an amazing job. You are the light of the world. You're not just salt to affect where we are. You know, salt does not work until there's contact. But somehow light is able to illuminate just because. So we are not just salt contact, but we are light. Light speaks of when, when you, if, there was, if it was dark and you light a light, it brings clarity, brings illumination, brings orientation, brings direction. That's what light does. Light, light is simply put, light, light is like, it's light, light is leadership. If you're walking in a, in, a, in a space that is dark, the person with the torch is the one at the front. You are the light of the world, not just in church, but at your workspace as well. The question is, are you at the front? You are not asking for permission to be at the front. No, you need to be a good steward. But there are some things you have to say. I will lead on this one because I cannot compromise. I have to lead somehow. You have to be at the front. No other way. You lead, you go for it. Don't, don't look for others to lead the way in matters of morality, for example. You have to lead the way. I need you to know that the Bible says that God has given you the mind of Christ. Christian inventions should be some of the ones that reverberate through eternity because we are not just applying our natural mind, we are applying the mind of Christ. There was a guy called by, uh, George Washington Carver. Uh, um, you can play it just a little bit low. George Washington Carver was a, a scientist, a black scientist in the States. Every day would wake up and say, Lord, teach me why or show me why you created the peanut. And he would pray with a peanut. And it's accredited to him as a Christian scientist that he came up with over 300 ways of using a peanut, including the peanut butter. We thank God for this man. We thank God. <laughs> but he knew that as a Christian, he had a divine role to apply the mind of Christ in coming up with stuff. Are you just an engineer or you realize that because I'm a Christian, we must have standards? So the standards are not because of business practices. The standards are because you are a Christian. You're not just having quality control because the government will come to check. You are having quality control in spite of whether the government comes to check because you are a Christian. We are not engaging in politics because, you know, it's good for us to engage in politics somehow, you know, like one of those loyalty things. No, it's because I am a Christian. Do you understand that you are the last line of defense? Do you understand that there is no other person coming? You are it. Light, light, light of the earth. Now, it's not light as in the source, it's light as in the reflection. It's like the moon. The, the sun is shining, the sun of man, oh, the sun of God is shining. We get to be like the moon, reflecting back his goodness and light and clarity over the earth. Now watch this. To the degree, to the degree that the earth comes between the sun and the moon, to so that degree that the moon reflects back the light back to the earth. And so when the world, the earth comes between the sun and the moon, then the moon is blocked out and cannot do nothing by itself. It's possible that you're not reflecting the light back because there's too much of the world for the light of glory. Come on. It's possible that you become ineffective because there is not, the, the world is between you and the Son of God, and so in as much as in essence you are the moon, but you can do nothing at your workspace. You can do nothing in the nation because there's nothing for you to give back to the earth. I want to pray for us. 
there are some things you can do. At least you can say, okay, I'll not be a partaker of darkness. I'll not engage in corruption. I'll not bribe. I'll not, I'll not be bought off, uh, 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 you know, um, in politically. We can do something today to bring light to the earth. We can do something today. And so I want to pray for some of us here today. I want to pray for someone who, they are hearing this and they're like, I hear I'm supposed to be the salt, I'm supposed to be the light, politically, economically, in my workspace. But I've done enough things that have removed the saltiness and light in me. With our heads bowed, we're just here to confess and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I want to ask you to just lift up your hand and we'll pray together. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. You know you've not been reflecting the light of God back. And maybe even choosing to reflect the light of God back will mean that you lose something. It will mean that you lose a, you lose a relationship. It will mean that you lose a job. It will mean that you lose favor with people. But because you are a Christian, then it matters. And that's why you can do it knowing that you'll end up in heaven anyway. You can put those hands down. Heavenly Father, thank you for your children. Hands have gone up in repentance. And you say that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have mercy on us, O oh God. For we all like sheep have gone astray and have wandered away from the paths of righteousness. Have mercy on us. Grant us the joy of forgiveness and lighten our hearts to the glory of God. Lord, those who have walked away from being salt, those who have walked away from being light, Lord, I want to pray that somehow they may regain the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. There is a name that is at stake, Lord, and we want to display the glory of your splendor. And so I want to pray for everyone whose hands has gone up. Lord, now as you bring a, bring a cleansing from that guilt, oh God, I want to pray that they'll stand up to be counted. We'll have Mordecai in our generation. We'll have people who can make a distinction, not because of fear of punishment, but because they are Christians. They are followers of Jesus. We thank you and we honor. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to pray for someone else who's you are about to enter into a situation and it's fearful for you because you know I'll have to be salt and light. Maybe you're about to enter into a relationship and you're afraid because you're like, will I truly be salt and light in this relationship? You're about to get into a workspace and how you've operated in the past makes you afraid to enter into the future. If you're like, if you're there in the place of decision, let me ask you to just lift up your hand. Anyone like that? Thank you for those hands. Anyone else? Thank you for those hands. You can put them down. Heavenly Father, these are your children. They're about to get into spaces that they have to make a distinction and say, I am a Christian. I'm a child of God. I want to pray for the grace that teaches us to say no to all ungodliness and teaches us to live an upright and blameless life in this present age. Give them that grace, O oh God, that they may say no to ungodliness that they may walk in boldly. Give them the boldness of Mordecai. Give them the grace that was upon him as well. That when you made a, 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 a choice to stand for you, then you made a choice to stand for him as well. So bless these ones. In Jesus' name I do pray and believe. And all of us said, finally I want to pray for someone who wants to join this fold of the unashamed. Join this fold of the fearless influencer. You are there and you've, you've never really given your life to Christ and you're saying, today is the day I need to make that decision. I have seen my wrong. I have seen where I have gone astray. But now I want to make a decision for Christ. If you are like that, let me ask you to raise up your hand and we'll pray together. Thank you for that hand. Any other hand? Any other person? Can we just celebrate our brother? Come on. I don't want to close this opportunity for anyone here who you came to church and you know you need to make a decision for Jesus. Are you there and you'd like to accept Jesus into your heart? Could you lift up your hand? Thank you for this. Oh, can we celebrate? Can we celebrate? Oh, the Lord is saving. The Lord is restoring people back to himself. If you've lifted up your hand, I want you to repeat after me. 
But I also want all of us as a congregation to repeat after me. Say, thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. I accept you into my heart. I accept you into my life. Make me the kind of person you created me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. If you've made that decision today, we don't take it lightly. I want to ask you that at the end of the service, just go to the info desk and go there and let the people there know that you gave your life to Christ. They'll take your details. And then somebody this week will give you a call. And if you are here and you have actually given your life to Christ in the past, but you didn't receive that call, maybe it's because you didn't have your details. Kindly go to the info desk. I'll give you a number there and then someone will be called you new this week just so that you can be able to walk with you uh, in this way. Amen? Amen and amen. Can we celebrate the Lord up in this place? Let me ask us to jump up on our feet. We've come to the end of our service. If you are a visitor, we are so glad that you are able to visit with us. Grandparents and parents who brought their kids today, we are happy to be uh, with you in this place. Uh, uh, every Sunday, we are always here at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And sure you let your friends get to know about that as well. For now, let me bless you even as we head out. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious with you and give you peace. In all your dealings, may he show you favor and grace. May he give you the boldness to say, because I'm a Christian, there are some things I cannot do. And let him help you to mean that from the core of your heart. In Jesus' name, we do pray and believe. And all of us said, amen, amen and amen. See you next Sunday.